from what we heard this morning. This next panel grapples with new fairness in the digitalized society. Today we were talking about the issue of new fairness for Europe and now we're going to be focusing on the digitalized society. So we have laid down the basis this morning and we're now going to look at going deeper into this idea of fairness in the digitalized society within which we live. Now the digitalized society is part and parcel of our daily lives across a whole raft of different areas. It is constantly changing the way we move, the way we communicate, the way we provide and receive care, the way that we work. Of course, it's a great opportunity, but at the same time, it is a cause for concern amongst the citizens. Because today, and tomorrow will be the case as well, uh, we're not all equal in the digitalized society. Some people are already benefiting hugely from this, but others fear that they will become further and further adrift socially. Data protection, hemming in the um, IT multinationals, mastering new communication methods, ethical issues vis-a-vis -vis the development of artificial intelligence. This all comes back to the social contract that we have underpinning our daily lives. So we are very fortunate to be able to welcome three very, very good speakers. I'd like to welcome them on my right. We have uh, Maria Gabriel, who needs no introduction whatsoever. I really do think he d she does uh, deserve a round of applause because we're very, very proud of her. We also have Dr. Sabine Herlitschka, CEO of Infineon Austria. And I'll give you more a detailed introduction when the time comes. And then on my left, we have Mr. Michael Hirschbrich, who is an entrepreneur specializing in digital issues. So as I said, I will provide more detailed introductions later on. But without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to Maria Gabriel. Maria, thank you very much for being here with us this afternoon. Whenever we need you, you're always there for us. And it is a veritable pleasure to hear you talk about an issue that is so important for the future of the European Union and its citizens, the future of our society. Maria, you have the floor. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Francoise. Thank you very much, Francoise. Chers collègues, encore. Dear colleagues, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your round of applause. That goes straight to my heart. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today with you and to be working hand in hand with you every day, every week. It is a great pleasure for me to address you today and to share some of my thoughts on this issue which is of great importance and is of course of great importance for our political group and that is fairness in the digitalized society. So I'd like to begin by saying that the digital transition, well there are challenges that Europe faces as a consequence and these are very significant challenges for two reasons primarily. First of all, fairness is at the heart of our European values in the same vein as protecting fundamental rights, trying to bring about a fairer society so everyone has uh, equal opportunities regardless of their origin. That is at the heart of the European Union. We also need to be aware that the digital revolution should not invalidate our project, it should add to it. It should beef it up, it should also contribute to greater equality. Who could have imagined that now we actually have access to the whole of the world's knowledge at the blink of an eye? 
and we can access the most um, prestigious courses at the most prestigious universities in the world via our computers and smartphones. But it's also, it can also be a challenge for equality because it reshuffles the social cards. Those who know the code and have access to the capital and access to the digital knowledge and those that have the, the best personal data, they're the ones that are very much on the up but then there are others that are adrift because they don't have access to the infrastructure, they perhaps don't have the, the business wherewithal or the business base to do that. So what we need to do in Europe is we need to think about the vectors of fairness in a digital age. And the second reason is fundamentally political. Without fairness, Europe will not succeed in transforming into a knowledge society. If there is a lesson that history constantly teaches us, it is that if there are no socio-economic perspectives, so in everyday terms, jobs, personal development, that leads populations to resist change and creates institutional dead ends. The world of, of business, university, civil society, we, the political decision makers, we need to make sure that the economic impact is shared out equally to make sure that change is accepted and there are considerable reforms and challenges ahead of us we need to make sure that we have the population on side and of course that goes above and beyond just the the initiated few basically without fairness we will not be able to craft a european a digital europe but how can we craft this digital Europe? And that's why I want to share four key ideas with you. First of all, the first need that we see is that Europe needs to increase its investment so we can actually catch up. We need to face facts. For the first time, Europe is not at the heart of the technological revolution. And European companies are lagging behind competitors in China and the US. I'll give you a few examples. The internet, which is the main, or the web, which is the main interface between um, users and the internet has become the almost exclusive property of Chinese and US companies. As of the top 200 uh, IT platforms, only 4% are European. I'll give you another figure. Since May 2018, the GAFA's uh, market value is $3.7 billion. That is more than Germany's GDP. No European company can get anywhere near this level. The biggest European companies have got about a thousand, uh, are worth about a thousand times less than Google and Apple. And the loss of that leadership role That should remind us that 100% of our growth is linked to our ability to innovate, but also our ability to keep sovereignty and our autonomy so that we can defend our values. So I think it's high time that Europe takes stock of this situation. And maybe it's high time to act in the same vein as the US did in 1957 when they succeeded in their first space flight. What the Americans did is they threw hundreds of millions uh, of dollars into this project. And we can see the benefits of it today, with the, the development of microprocessors, the development of the in internet, GPS that we all use, even if we have Galileo here in Europe, all of these technologies which are at the heart of the digital world. So. That is the first thing I have to say today. We need to invest a lot and we also need to invest in a strategic manner. What President Juncker is trying to do with the digital single market is exactly that. 
I'd like to recall that the digital single market is incredibly unstable because you can see people are questioning Europe from the inside and from the outside. And we need to make sure that Europe pays dividends for citizens. So we need to make sure that we can make steps forward, such as bringing an end to roaming, an end to geo-blocking. We'll soon have Wi-Fi for EU. And there are other examples I could mention. We're looking ahead to the next EU budget and we have done something new for the first time. Our proposal is to have a new Digital Europe programme with a, a budget of 900 billion euros. And our message is very simple here. There are five key areas where no member state is big enough to actually step up to the plate. But these are key areas for our citizens and our economies. So it needs to be done at a European level. We need to send a clear message to our citizens, a clear message to our companies, a clear message to our international partners. That means investing in artificial intelligence. Citizens are afraid of artificial intelligence at present. We need to uh, invest in cyber security as well. Cyber security is not just personal data, it's also critical infrastructure, transport, energy, health. We also need to invest in digital skills. I'm going to come back to that later on in my presentation. That is one of the things that I believe is of paramount importance. We also need to invest in supercomputers. That seems like it's very technical. But uh, in uh, 2012, uh, in Europe, we had uh, uh, four of the, of the top ten. We don't even have any in the top ten now. We have uh, excellent researchers. They have excellent expertise. We want to harness that. We need to invest in administrations as well, because that is the primary interface for citizens. So it's essential that national governments support this European ambition. The second key area now, yes, we need to invest in terms of regaining the, um, the worldwide leadership role in this area. But we also need to provide tangible answers because our citizens feel more and more under threat. You hear it more and more that people um, feel that they're being left behind by globalization. The digital transition is making them feel ever more excluded. That's a perception that people have and it's becoming more and more tangible. We need to actually address these concerns. We need to address these concerns. And of course, we need to ensure access to infrastructure, access to the internet and the services contained therein. We also need to um, link this to um, industrial change and work on artificial intelligence, creating jobs, and looking at developments in different regions, looking at how things are going to develop over time. And there's also another issue which is of great importance here. We need to invest in the digital skills of our citizens. Today, 80 million Europeans have never used the internet. Only 43% of European citizens have basic digital skills. Only 37% of our uh, working methods well, we know that there are, are, are many jobs out there that need basic digital skills. So what we need to do is invest massively in digital skills. And when we talk about digital skills, well, I can't fail to mention women. If we're talking about a major challenge here, that's women in the digital world. It's now time to invest in, so that we have more and more women um, in the STEM subjects. We have more and more female entrepreneurs. These are skills that we want to enable them to obtain as part of the digital transformation. The third key area, and I think this is an area where Europe really does need to take on a leadership role. We need to think about ethical issues in a world where the um, primary resource is uh, personal data. Artificial intelligence, it's also uh, collecting and processing personal data. And we can have the best in the world and the worst in the world here. Depends on what we want. In Europe, we need to make sure that we can properly address these issues. How we can ensure personalised services in terms of healthcare and employment. But at the same time, we need to address ethical issues. 
which of course are intrinsically linked to our values. That's what we've done for artificial intelligence because after the announcement of our strategy in the month of April, we have set up a high level expert group and we have also set up a European alliance for artificial intelligence, which as of September will be drawing up very precise recommendations on ethical issues vis-a-vis -vis artificial intelligence. I would also like to encourage you to pass on this message because within the uh, alliance we've seen over the last month, month and a half, we've seen more than a thousand associations come on board, universities, um, SMEs, individual citizens even, and that really shows that there is an enormous amount of interest in uh, working on this particular issue. Thinking about fairness, I think we need to apply that to companies too. And perhaps we are not saying this loudly enough. Okay, we have 4% of the platforms, we are lagging behind, but if you look at what has happened with Cambridge Analytica, for instance, the European Union today, slowly but surely, is becoming the um, is setting down the rules for um, the digital economy throughout the world with uh, a GDPR and with the um, proposals that we've had for platform to business. Our approach is based on targeted proposals, but I think that this issue of ensuring a level playing field and ensuring fairness, that is a, an asset that Europe has to feed into other policies. Of course, we have to follow what is happening of course there's a dilemma here because we have to ensure that uh, the, uh, the the networks can innovate and can uh, create jobs and create growth but at the same time we need to make sure that we are courageous enough to talk about transparency responsibility and rules and Europe I think can really provide an alternative because we're not the US we're not China we have values I'd now like to talk about the fourth issue, disinformation, protecting, safeguarding democracy. Technology has radically overhauled the way citizens access information, but we're not all equal when it comes to online disinformation. People use online social networks on a daily basis, those with a higher level of education tend to place their faith more in specific media players. Now, disinformation, fake news has become an extremely serious problem. What are the worst re repercussions of uh, disinformation? It's that there is no faith anymore, no faith or trust between citizens and institutions, no mutual trust between citizens. And so it is extremely important that we champion our democracy. We carried out a survey of European citizens. 83% of European citizens feel that fake news disinformation is a threat to our democratic model. We need to take this debate further. There are major issues at stake here. What is our response to this challenge? Well, it won't be easy and it won't be swift. What are we doing? We are looking to strengthen the resources available to citizens so that they can sift through the information available to them and make an informed choice. That is what makes for a democratic citizen. We need to look at uh, the curricula in our education systems. We want to support uh, independent networks of fact checkers. By the end of September, I expect platforms, social networks and NGOs to come together and to come up with a code of conduct that they will put to me as a tool to fight online disinformation, fake news. 
I expect to report by the 26th of uh, September. By the end of October, I'd like to see initial results. Otherwise, in December, I reserve the right to produce an analysis and to go even further, indeed, as far as a legislative proposal, if need be. No one can tell me that it is not possible to act on algorithm transparency, fake accounts, uh, sponsorship ads, and so on and so forth. And we need to keep a keen eye on developments. This is key to the EPP family. Our values are at stake and we must defend them. I don't, I'm not placing all my faith in platforms. You will have understood that. Recent cases have demonstrated that when choosing between economic interests and values, they tend to opt for the former. Cambridge Analytica comes to mind here. The copyright vote in uh, July is another good example. We've never seen such a campaign uh, targeting the European Parliament to that extent. So as you can see, our Europe, digital, competitive, inclusive, fair Europe, it's a real challenge day in, day out to achieve that goal. We need close cooperation between all digital stakeholders in the private and public sectors. Now, I would like to wind up by saying that this ambitious vision must be flanked by investment. Our Europe must continue to pay attention to what sets us apart from others. Let's bear in mind that robots will never replace humans. Creativity, innovation, uh, that human touch is vital. Europe's future will be digital, but above all, it will be the future that we shape for ourselves. History has shown that there is no challenge that Europe cannot take on once it decides to throw everything at that challenge. So we need to act. We need to galvanize our forces. And I would like to thank you in Parliament. I really don't believe uh, that I get the impression I have left the European Parliament behind uh, since I joined the Commission, and that is thanks to you your talent, your ideas, you help us to move forward. So once again, I'd like to thank you. I would be delighted to field any questions and engage in the ensuing debate. Thank you. A well-deserved round of applause for Maria. You're young, quite brilliant. We always knew that you were resolved to push back boundaries. And I firmly believe that your resolve will help us to move forward. It is urgent, as you say, that the European Union catch up where it is lagging behind. Thank you for your speech. It really was uh, enlightening for all of us. I'd now like to move on to our second speaker, Dr. Herlischka, you are um, CEO of a major electronics and robotics company, Infian Technologies. You're also chair of the governing body of a European public-private partnership, Excel Electronic Components and Systems. Thank you, madam, for finding the time to join us, and I'm sure that your professionalism and experience will be extremely enlightening. Over to you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, and thanks for the invitation to speak to you here today. Um, I could not uh, join your ex exchange this morning 
and I'm, I assume hearing from what has been mentioned, I assume you had extensive discussions on what fairness really means. For me, fairness is a key element, a cornerstone of our European values. And therefore, I really want to congratulate you that you took this topic in the center of your exchange here, because I think it's highly needed. I want to comment on these three questions. They were, I was asked to make a few comments on those. Basically, uh, what are the key innovations that are having the potential to change, to shape our world and our societies, and as such, have an implication on what we perceive as fairness. The second element uh, is the role of European cooperation in our European context and in the context in relation to our perception of values and fairness. And the third point, and this I will touch only very briefly, is the role of trade agreements in the globalized world. Now about fairness, uh, I, I consider the um, the summary of the University of Cambridge on fairness quite helpful, and I'm sure this, this was mentioned today already. Now, what is the context? I look at all these points. Uh, as mentioned, uh, I'm in charge of Infineon Technologies Austria, and therefore a brief summary of Infineon. We have four key competence areas, energy efficiency, mobility, security, and everything about data. Uh, we have uh, a corporate network of nowadays almost 40,000 employees. And you see here in Europe some almost 16,000. Um, and we work with a broad network of research and technology, but also manufacturing. And yes, indeed, we do manufacturing in Europe. We had a revenue last year of 7 billion. And in our area, microelectronics, uh, we serve those three markets. In our area, we are either market leader or we are not really playing a role. And therefore, you see, we are market leader in energy efficiency applications, power electronics, as it said, security applications, also number one, and mobility automotive applications here globally, number two. And in Austria, we are represented here basically by 10% of the global staff. And we have some 25% of the global Infineon corporate R&D personnel represented in Austria. We had a revenue of 2.5 billion last year. Nowadays, we are the most research intense company in Austria. We started some 50 years ago at that time, f pure, cheap manufacturing. Nowadays, we change the company to the most research intense companies. And for those of you who do not really have a feeling of what we do, I can show later and I show here. This is a small chip that all of you most likely used already because we are in every third smartphone worldwide with our silicon microphones. So if your sound, if the sound of your smartphones is good, you have a microphone from us. <laughs> and this, these microphones are to a large extent developed in Austria and they are manufactured in Austria. And just recently we announced that we are doing an investment into a new manufacturing site in Austria worth 1.6 billion. This is the largest investment in our sector that has been done not only in Austria, but currently also the largest investment in Europe in our sector. So in summary, we are a company in a tough area that believes in Europe and that invests massively in Europe. So talking about the key innovations, and I want to, to start off with this picture, not going into the details, but with the message saying that key innovations have to serve society. 
and our global mega trends, and you can name basically probably the same ones. The key global mega trends, I consider the four listed here, not going into the details, but just talking about climate change and resource efficiency. Keep in mind that still today, some 80% of our energy supply is still delivered by fossil, is still based on fossil. That's incredible. That's not sustainable. And this is one of the global mega trends, mega challenges, societal challenges we have to take care of. Or how to make growth possible, considering that most likely by 2050 we're going to have 9 billion people here, the majority living in cities. How are going to cities going to look like? And digital transformation has been mentioned already with a challenge in itself. So what's the key innovation? What do I consider as a key innovation? Making more out of less. Increasing efficiency. And as such, digital technologies are the key drivers. So what can it mean? More power with less resources. Relying on the energy efficiency potentials, for instance. Nowadays, I consider energy efficiency as the most powerful energy resource and not just 80% fossil based. Or, not going into all the details, looking at mobility. We do need a more sustainable mobility. That's being built on most likely automated driving, autonomous driving, and elect maybe electric, uh, electric mobility, we shall see. So digitalization is, to my understanding and conviction, the key innovation driver, all the digital technologies, because they allow to make growth possible in a sustainable way, increasing the efficiency and making more out of less. And of course, it affects all areas of our life and has to serve and benefit society. This is the way how I look at it. Now, looking at some other facts and figures before I come to the conclusions. Digitalization is driven by microelectronics. Why microelectronics? Microelectronics links the real with the digital world. Without microelectronics, no digitalization. What's the European potential based on our estimations driven by the trends like sustainable mobility, energy efficiency, Internet of Things, and then implemented through innovations like the smart car, like Industry 4.0? We estimate that by 2020, some 45% of European GDP will rely on microelectronics, some 45% by 2020. 2020 is basically tomorrow. So, and what about the market of semiconductors, microelectronics? You see that here, this small triangle in purple on the bottom, that's the microelectronics market, some 400 billion. And that's the lever, that's the impacting factor microelectronics plays into the broader applications like the electronics market or like the broader industry applications. Or pragmatically speaking, if your car has a problem, most likely it's the electronics and you will not be able to fix it. But look at the figures. If this small triangle, those 400 billion, does not take place, all the upper mentioned applications, industry applications, will not take place either. And therefore, this small market of 400 billion is the lever into all the industry consumer applications, and here at global level, estimated by roughly 80 billion. 
Now, what is Europe doing here? Uh, because I was asked to comment on the European cooperation and the needs. Europe has taken a bit more of a strategic view on technology and innovation. Some key enabling technologies have been defined for the first time in 2009 and have been renewed. These are the three building blocks that at European level have been considered as important. Micro and nanoelectronics as one of them, artificial intelligence naturally as one of them, or security and connectivity. So yes, we had some um, appropriate activities in, in a broader context, the digital single market has been mentioned, but also most recently the communication by the communication under the leadership of Commissioner Gabriel on artificial intelligence, the public-private partnerships, linking and focusing the funding, but also the proposal on Horizon Europe and the proposal on Digital Europe. Yes, indeed, that has, been hap that's, that has happened. However, taking a look beyond what's happening. Now, the Made in China 25 strategy, I think, is quite significant. And from the Chinese point of view, it's the right instrument. But from our European point of view, we should think about that. Made in China 20, 2025 identifies 10 core areas. What do they want to achieve? They want to get broader market share and again look at the figures. The uh, light blue is the estimated market that they want to achieve. That's, that's what you see here by Chinese companies in 25. And that's the status in 2020 that they have. Now, these are market shares on the right hand side, 80%. And you see how ambitious this is. And again, from the Chinese point of view, this is the right way. But nevertheless, what does it mean for us? They put the right focus areas, and they have the speed and the boldness to do that. And altogether, what do they achieve? They combine technology from outside, own capabilities, market demand, which they have, and huge amounts of money and public money. And therefore, this is really significant. One of these key enabling technologies is artificial intelligence. And look how the status is here. For good reason, the Commission has come up with the communication in April, with the, the, the goal of investing 20 billion by 2020. And as of 2020, each year, 20 billion for a period of 10 years. Now, if the commissioner talks about massive investments, these are massive investments. But look where we stay here in comparison. On the left-hand side, you see the patent applications. And on the right-hand side, you see the number of companies and all to be multiplied by 1,000. Now, where is Europe? Yes, of course, we can say we have to add the various countries, but this doesn't really make it better. So we have a lot to do, and time has become a crucial factor. Now, here, to, to add to the previous slide, the transformative potential of artificial intelligence also estimated let's say, the market potential that it has. In comparison, look again at China, at North America and Europe. And I think the figures speak for themselves. And then again, again, look at the ambitions on the side of China. The Chinese government aims to build 50 billion artificial intelligence market by 2018, yeah, now. Time. So, and then a third uh, data point I, I want to add here. This is, this is based on an excellent study by McKinsey done in 2016, analyzing the global flows and in particular comparing it to data flows. And their statement is a very blunt one. 
Globalization and data flows have entered a new area, an, a new era. They have really transformative, disruptive potential. If we talk about trade agreements, we still mainly talk about goods. But here what you see that has happening in the case of data is significant. And this is 2014. So a huge amount of um, uh, activities going on here. And one of the figures I want to share with you here uh, is related, uh, related to that is 12% of the global goods trade 12%, 12% is based on e-commerce by platforms. The commissioner has mentioned to what, to what extent we are represented by platforms. Yeah, so not a lot. And yeah, more and more trade is being done there and the, the figures are already significant. And uh, I won't go into the details here for the sake of time, but this is also extremely interesting and I'm happy to provide the chart to you, giving you a feeling of what this changing character really means in comparison to previously and nowadays, also with respect to fairness and our values. Now, talking about technology, and I think I have pointed that out, and in particular platforms, data platforms. You see here, I think, a highly appropriate chart of The Economist. The data is the new oil, as many people say. The data platforms and uh, the Chinese way. So what I, what, what I want to express here, that if you think about it, Everything that's being done with technology cannot be separated from the values that are linked to them. And I give you an example. If, you, if, if some of you have seen or participated in Mark Zuckerberg's hearing at the European Parliament, um, you, you of course have heard that he was excusing himself and said sorry, but in essence, in replying to the questions, I had the feeling that he doesn't really understand what the problem is. Because based on the Silicon Valley attitude, everything that can be done is being done. So what's the issue on data security and privacy? So this is linked to the Silicon Valley understanding of technology and its underlying values. Or the Chinese way, think of the China social credit system. I have shown you the artificial intelligence facts in China. Here I can add, China is currently implementing the largest artificial intelligence life experiment. By 2020, every citizen being included in a China social credit system. Now, the credits are related to the values. And these values are enabled by the technology. So the question really is, what's our way behind that? And before coming to the conclusions, I want to show you another status of where we stand. What you see here is those 20, the largest semiconductor microelectronics companies globally, based and ranked according to their revenue. And remember microelectronics at, at this, as this technology that links the real to the digital world, that is the enabler for this major trend of digitalization. So what you most likely notice here that um, you have quite a lot of companies in green. Those are the ones owned by America. You have quite a number in purple. Those are the ones headquartered in Asia. And you have three ones left in Europe. And we can be lucky because nowadays it's three. We, run, we ran into the danger that it might have been only two because NXP was on the way to being sold to Qualcomm. And this acquisition did not happen. Guess what? 
because the Chinese government had security concerns. Not because Europe was concerned, but the Chinese government had security concerns. Now, what I want to say here and underline here is, we have to take a much more strategic look at our core competences, because our core competences, key enabling technologies like artificial intelligence, like micro and nanoelectronics, like the ones you have seen, they are linked to the way of being implemented. And this way of being implemented is linked to our values. And I do think we need more Europe in this respect. Now, what's being done here, and I'm not going into the details, but you see here the US, not only under the current administration, but also already under Obama II, uh, has, has implemented quite a number of tough issues. In China, another figure I want to convey to you and share with you, China invests 160 billion to build up its own semiconductor industry. Because nowadays, China invests more, pays more for microelectronics, for semiconductor import, than for oil. For oil. So China is very tough on that, and with its China 2025 strategy, it has, to made, it has made the right, the right steps. Now we in Europe, what do we do here? Well, we can be happy. We have a third leading semiconductor company because the acquisition of NXP did not work out. So we have, in this example of microelectronics, we have three global players left. But I do think we have to take actions to ensure that we have the, technology, the technological strength to implement our values. And for instance, we do not have a functionality that takes care of this strategic relevance of our companies, like for instance in the US. And finally, before coming to the conclusions, here another interesting chart, the acquisitions of China in Europe, indicated by billion euros. The darkest red is the highest number, and what you see here, of course, the UK and Germany and France being very much exposed. And then an interesting comparison. Uh, would the same acquisitions be possible the other way around? We are talking about level playing field. No. Yeah? China would not allow these types of acquisitions that China is doing constantly in Europe. And we are keeping up free trade, which is fine. But if we lose our competitive strength in Europe and thus our societal system, we are gone. So, and finally, for the conclusions and based on, on the questions that I was asked to comment on, I think digitalization is the real transformative opportunity in particular for Europe. Why? Because Europe, we are not just talking about the knowledge economy and society, we are on the way to developing into it and we are at already at the stage of having implemented quite a part of it. Now, therefore, digital digitalization is particularly important for Europe and such an opportunity for Europe that we have not experienced the last decades. The digital transformation is more than technology. However, and this is also what, what I want to highlight, the digital transformation will be decided by technology and therefore we need to have a more strategic way of working together in Europe and massively investing. And at the core of digitalization are the key technological competences, those key enabling technologies. I consider them as the new technological geopolitical currency 
Why? Because they are system relevant. Our society would not work without, without, without those competences. And they are important to ensuring our societal model, our sovereignty, our security, and our further development. And therefore, I think that we also have to take the right decisions for framework conditions, like on Horizon Europe, on new ways of working together, on a foreign direct investment screening, and the multi-annual financial framework, again, to be put into this context and many uh, uh, steps to be made here. And on global uh, trade agreements, I think the core element should be truly global level playing field conditions. And this is tough to be achieved in particular if you look at Europe. So I do think in conclusion, we have a lot that we can be proud of. We have a lot to be done and I think the world needs more Europe and therefore we have to make sure that we implement all these activities with a crucial view on time, on timely implementation. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, madame. Vraiment, nous vous avons... Thank you very much. We... Uh listened very closely to what you had to say. You really opened our eyes. We can see that Europe is lagging behind and a lot of work facing Maria Gabriel. Now, time is marching on, so I'll have to very quickly introduce our next speaker, Michael Hirschbrich. He is an entrepreneur, a businessman, uh, a digital expert, and you'll find out even more about him through his presentation. You have the floor now without further ado. So it's an honor for me to be here and being able to talk to you. You ask an artificial intelligent nerd to think and talk about fairness. So this could be an experiment, but I try to do my best to bring those two worlds together uh, on a also more political level. A um, little bit of a background, what we do here, we are a research company in Austria. Basically, start, we started in Silicon Valley 11 years ago building artificial intelligence, purely focusing on artificial intelligence. And um, we try to connect the, the strengths of both worlds, moving more and more back to Europe for a various of reasons. So what is the foundation of fairness in a digital society was a question that I would, was asked. And I tried to answer it with the eyes of an AI developer. When you talk about fairness, probably what comes to your mind as a political thinker is what is an equal access to education, to freedom, to welfare, to prosperity. And how can we guarantee those values for all of our citizens? And uh, when I put it into the search engine, I did not use Google, I used the French search engine Quant, which I can recommend to you. The first results that showed up, building a system of fairness for all citizens, was Bill Clinton winning the elections in 92, saying it's the economy stupid. So at the end of the day, you need to build an economy for the future to be able to provide all those values and ingredients for your citizens. Today, I would say from an AI perspective, it's not the economy stupid, it's the data economy stupid. So if you say the economy builds the foundation of fairness, because it provides everything you need to spread the opportunities, then today it's the data economy that should provide fairness. And so to say, data economy leads to fairness. We need to figure out how this is going to work. So how come? If we look into the economy from a data perspective, what really counts is making smart and right decisions. And smart and right decisions are always based on two ingredients. You have the right information you base them on, the right data. But second, you have the right amount of quality of this information. This is how you make a good decision 
in business, in the government, all the stakeholders, and all the employees that work for us. So John D. Rockefeller, when he founded the Standard Oil Company, he created the foundation of the American success story, I would say even until today, by just taking the right information and making the right decision for the right product. Today, it's not different. Still, what we need in order to be successful entrepreneurs is we make smart decisions based on the right amount of information, quality of data, and analysis. It's always the same thing. So when you think about that, the question is, who is the best decision maker? So you have the data, you have the quality of data, you need to make right decisions based on this data. Who is the best decision maker? How do you find out? And the answer, unfortunately, many fields already today and much more in the upcoming future is it's not us anymore. What is the best decision? How do you define it? As I said, it's high amount of data, really high amount of data today. It's the high quality of this data. I want to repeat that because it's really important to understand how AI works. It's the experience that we collect it's, so to say, the sum of all experience that was taken. And you need high intelligence to process all of those. And you should be fast, right? This is the ingredient of a successful decision-making procedure. Intelligence, so to say, that you require to process the data and make smart decisions is the capability, and this is a definition that I love, it's the capability of autonomous learning and making smart decisions based on it. If you shorten it, you can say intelligence means decision making. And it's interesting, when you talk to scientists at university, they give you like a tons of explanations and definitions how intelligence is defined, but more and more give you exactly this explanation. Intelligence means autonomous decision making. So what we have at the end of the day, looking at the last evolution and the upcoming uh, evolution, we have the Homo sapiens with the human intelligence developing more and more to an artificial intelligence. And if a human is defined by its intelligence, which we humans love to do, right? We always say, what does us, what is the difference between humans and, I don't know, animals? It's our intelligence, self-reflection, our way of making decisions. Then I ask you, how do we call or treat something, I put in neutral words, how do we call or treat something that's becoming more intelligent than us? And unfortunately, this question, which is also a philosophical one, is not science fiction anymore. We should deal with it. It's not just a product or a service that is coming up here. It's an intelligent engine that can provide great services and do something bad as well for whatever reason or for whatever task you use it for. So let's look at those players that use artificial intelligence massively and become successful with it, like the Google AI intelligence. Why is it so intelligent? Because they have the major ingredient, data. One third of global data is being accessed. It's not owned legally but it's accessed by Google, one-third of the global data. Of course, this is a huge amount for machine learning and to build a neural network that is massively intelligent. In the 17th century, all amount of information that we had that we created as humans would double every seven years. Today, pardon? It's not working? I can use this one. Do you hear me now? Yeah, sorry. In the 17th century, all existing data doubled every seven years, and today just takes three weeks. The entire amount of information that is available globally. So with this increasing amount of data, what you get is what we say an intelligent explosion. Because the intelligence requires the data, and the more data you feed, the more intelligent the neural network becomes. In Silicon Valley, some folks call it the singularity. I say, don't, let's not care about the term, 
But what's important is we are at the tipping point of a new form of intelligence. When you look at another company, not just Google, Amazon, they were in the news like I think yesterday. The valuation now is at one trillion dollars. The money they spend in research is 23 billion dollars. I think Austria spends 11.5 billion dollars pri privately and publicly put together. It's one company in the United States that spends the double amount and most of it goes into, guess what? Artificial intelligence. The main key factor for success of Amazon is their prediction model. It's revolutionary. Predicting what you want to buy, when you have to have it delivered, and which picture you sh I show you for the next purchase. So AI, obviously, if we believe it or not, but obviously, if you look at the fact, it's becoming the core technology of this fourth industrial uh, revolution. And I don't really like this uh, landscape here because China is so small because they forgot to add the public uh, investments. But be why do I show it and why did I leave it there? Because Israel and United Kingdom, frankly, they do really a great job. And I can tell you that in the UK, they have a new fund of 17 billion pounds just for buying IP intellectual property of AI and making them move to the United Kingdom. So the Brexit for me as a nigh guy is a threat because most of AI intellectual property in Europe is created or going to London. If you look at, at the investments publicly and privately put together, um, it's more obvious, so Asia invests and spends, I would say, three to four times more than we do currently. And of course, it's a question of also money and those resources to be able to keep up with those global forces. So how about force, uh, fairness? How can we link those uh, topics together uh, at the end of my um, uh, thoughts? I think that our capabilities to provide fairness as a European continent indeed can be defined by the decisions we make today to create a powerful European artificial intelligence, and this is important for all citizens. I don't see AI as a tool for one corporation or one government, as it's now in Silicon Valley in China. AI is more than that. It's an intelligence force that we have to provide for all citizens, and then it answers the question of fairness um, of the future. So in, in my view, European AI will lead to a better and faster decision which makes us more successful for the corporations, for the SMEs, and there are tons of ideas how we can support them because they are not capable financially to participate in AI research, but we have 90-95% of our GDP depending on SMEs, so we need to give them the power to work with AI together. I would say we need to do that in clusters. Let's use AI for the government, for the schools, for the courts, everywhere else where we have enough European data to make those systems work. If we have those tools that can make us in, in Europe more successful, those AI tools, the major questions I think that we should answer in the next couple of years are, who is creating this IP, this intellectual property? Is it universities, is it corporations? And when they are creating those IP rights, who owns this IP in the long run? This is not just a patent, this is not just an engine. This is something we really should think also on a more, uh, on a bigger scale. And who will benefit from this massive productivity increase? And last but not least, my final question here is, and how does every European citizen benefit from this AI efforts? Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Oula. Merci beaucoup, excusez-moi. Thank you. We don't have much time. I have a long list of speakers I'll ask. Each of you to take just one minute no comments. Just put your question to our panelists. I'll take all questions in one fell swoop.